So good morning, everyone. Thanks for being with us today. This is Mark Millam with the Flight Safety Foundation. And along with me, I've got Greg Marshall and Frank Jackman. Would you guys like to say hi? Hi, everyone. Good morning. Together, we're here to talk about our GSIP program, our Global Safety Information Project. We hope you've already heard something about it. Greg, Frank, and I are Flight Safety Foundation staff members and we're involved in the program and technical work of the foundation. For decades, the foundation has been the center of so many efforts to advance safety. We've said it before here, improving safety today is getting tougher in this industry, but it never stops getting inter being interesting. With the stellar aviation safety record today, it gets harder to improve things because so much has already been done with technology in the aircraft airports and air navigation. The industry has improved its training programs and procedures through safeguards on lessons learned from other accidents. Safety management systems are widespread and some organizations have been using them for more than a decade. This is part three of a four-part series on GSIP and we'll assume that most of you know something about this and are practicing as an aviation safety professional. Our invitations went out to people and organizations that have worked with us before in focus groups and workshops in the Pan American and Asia Pacific regions of the world. They also went out to the Flight Safety Foundation membership. So with that as our assumption, we'll move through the topics very quickly and make the most of your time. If you haven't heard much about this project, I'd encourage you to visit the flightsafety.org website and review the GSIP pages and documents already out there on display. We have two annual reports and some of the first documents or our toolkits uh, and if you're a member of the foundation you have access to the draft portions of the detailed toolkits that we're talking about today. One other note before we start you'll notice a status bar at the bottom of the page along with a slide count this provides a position marker if you're reviewing a recorded replay of this webinar. We don't release the slides separately, but if you're viewing this recording, this little marker will help you jump around quickly to get to any part of the webinar. So let's take a look at the agenda for today. Right now we're going through the introduction in, in the first part of this agenda. But as in each of our GSIP webinars, we cover data collection, data analysis, information sharing, and information protection. We're suggesting components to programs that might be part of either an individual organization's SMS or a regular's SSP. At the end of our presentation, we'll provide a conclusion. So if we roughly take 10 minutes on each item in the presentation, it'll take about an hour. Then in the second part, we'll take some time in the discussion portion for questions and comments. We're going to ask questions of our audience this time, not only for the reactions, but a little bit about their experience in these areas, especially on proactive and predictive risk management. So if you don't mind, we'd like to ask a little bit about uh, our audience and find out who they represent. We're going to post a poll here. If you could answer that, it might give everyone a little bit better sense of who is in the audience. We've got about 30% uh, of the people voting. That's climbing up to 43%, now getting close to 60. 71%. Okay, that looks good. Let's. Uh, present that to everyone. Biggest group is uh, regulators. Um, that's good to know. And uh, behind that is other industry stakeholders and a smaller group on uh, other operators. Uh, and no uh, commercially scheduled airlines or ANSPs. So we'll keep that in mind. Um, Frank, you want to get us started? Sure, Mark. Almost all industries are learning from their operational data and gathering more of it every day. 
We have said before in our webinars that the digital world is not just automating things. We are measuring and recording everything we can think of, which is part of the reason that the world's databases and the Internet are growing so quickly. We'll, we will be talking again today about collecting data. But not only that, we will discuss how this data becomes information and how information becomes knowledge for decision makers. Without good organization and analysis, this volume of data could be overwhelming. At the end of the day, we need to focus on what's important, how and what we can learn from this data, focus on what's important and how and what we can learn from this data to avoid a bad outcome. In the first webinar in this series, we went through the basic elements of safety management. In the second webinar, we focused on how measured and recorded data is increasingly being used with analysis tools that illustrate exactly how the aircraft was flown. In today's webinar, we want to talk about how we need to make sense of multiple data collection efforts from time to time through special studies. But before we get into this, I'd like to ask a question. Why? Mark, why is the Foundation's work, why is the Foundation working on this project? Well, I think it's simple. As the world gets safer and safer, we've all got to get smarter on how we improve our performance. In many areas of the world, we're seeing that performance start to plateau. And as the world continues to grow in our operations, and, as, and if the rate remains the same, we'll see more and more accidents. That's just not acceptable. We believe the industry has the knowledge and capability to improve its performance and Flight Safety Foundation has always supported projects like this. And we believe in many of the elements of ICAO's Annex 19 and the Global Aviation Safety Plan. So ICAO Annex 19 is entitled Safety Management and it's got the following requirements. First of all, the service provider shall develop and maintain a formal process that ensures hazards associated with its aviation products or services are identified and that hazard identification shall be based on a combination of reactive, proactive, and predictive methods of safety data collection. In developing the toolkits, the Flight Safety Foundation identified a variety of reactive, proactive, and predictive data collection and analysis methods. We grouped them into varying levels of intensity to form material appropriate for a variety of stakeholders with different types of safety data collection and processing systems. So in addition to being used in Annex 19, the terms reactive, proactive, and predictive are also used through I, throughout ICAO document 9859, which is the safety management manual. You may already be familiar with them, but we'll go over them quickly to make sure their meanings are well understood. When we're identifying hazards, the term reactive indicates some sort of past outcome or event. This could be something like an investigation into an incident or accident to determine the hazards that played a role in that event. In other words, we're reacting to an event that has already taken place. Shifting to the present, we use the term proactive to describe analysis of existing current or real-time situations. For example, safety surveys, employee reporting, or other methods of identifying what's currently taking place in an organization or in a specific process. Finally, the term predictive refers to the future, specifically gathering data and identifying possible negative future outcomes or events. An example of predictive analysis is analyzing data sources and performing statistical trend analysis to try and predict where the weak spots are in our defenses. Statistically, there is always going to be something most likely for an undesired outcome, and we want to focus on what we can do about that now. Newly emerging threats are also something we want to estimate possible risks. So with these terms in mind, we'll have a look at what's covered by the Level 1 Toolkit. In terms of data collection, the Level 1 Toolkit has both reactive and proactive elements. 
The toolkit emphasises collecting information on accidents, incidents and events reported through mandatory occurrence reporting requirements and analysing occurrences to understand what took place. Cause effect, Ishikawa or fishbone type diagrams are one method introduced in this toolkit to permit this kind of reactive analysis. The level one toolkit also introduces a few methods of proactive data collection such as the establishment of employee voluntary safety reporting programs and conducting safety surveys and compliance audits. In terms of proactive analysis, the toolkit details methods for conducting risk probability and impact assessments and discusses steps to help an organisation develop safety performance indicators. All of these are things that can help an organisation assess the current state of their operations. And building off of the reactive and proactive steps introduced at level one, the level two toolkit introduces additional proactive data sources such as flight data monitoring for aircraft operators. For other types of organizations the toolkit details other automated and or system-based data sources like ATC radar data for ANSPs or ACARS data for aircraft manufacturers. These data sources paint a clear picture of current operations. In terms of analysis, the Level 2 Toolkit introduces the Bowtie method of risk assessment, enabling organizations to identify and document risk scenarios and factors in an easy to understand diagram. The additional proactive data gathered at this level of intensity will also help organizations refine and revalidate the safety performance indicators they developed at, at Level 1. Level 3 toolkit takes all of the elements detailed in levels 1 and 2 and adds additional proactive data sources and analysis techniques while also introducing predictive data analysis. For data collection, the Level 3 toolkit outlines observational programs like line observations safety audits or LOSA programs for aircraft operators and normal operation safety survey or NOS programs or ANSPs. These data sources provide both a proactive perspective, that is what is currently happening in your operations, but can also be used in conjunction with the level three data analysis techniques to take a predictive look at future risk exposure to guide the development of protective defenses. In the level three toolkit, the foundation introduces advanced bow tie modeling techniques which incorporate a multitude of data sources, including observation programs like LOSA to develop highly detailed representations of risk. The Level 3 Toolkit also details some specific methods for conducting predictive trend analysis and, de and developing detailed deep dive studies in areas of particular interest to assess what's currently impacting your operations and what will impact them in the future. We know many organizations are collecting this data, doing their own analysis, and some are attempting to share what they learn. The vast majority of this data is not part of any accident investigation where a report is shared publicly. So that means this data is not protected in many places of the world. While we would like to see information protection as a foundation for all the other activities, we know that SMS programs are being adopted around the world and that the protection measures will have to catch up. So in the Global Safety Information Project, we're taking all four of these activities and covering them in greater depth. In our first webinar, we started to talk about some of the basic activities in what we call Level 1, discussing both reactive and proactive methods. In the second webinar, we covered a more advanced examination of risk through measured data. It discussed mostly proactive methods. During this webinar, we will cover data collection and analysis in special studies. This is primarily proactive and predictive. This level can involve even greater levels of information sharing that are external to your organization. We also have ideas about a fourth level. OK, 
Okay. Another polling question, just to kind of understand our audience a little bit better. We know that uh, uh, nearly half represent a regulator, but we'd like to find out your familiarity with GSIP. So have you participated in uh, GSIP events previously? If you could help us by answering this poll, uh, that would be appreciated. Got about 60% of the vote in, 70%, 80%. I think we can share that back. Excellent. Looks like uh, two-thirds of you have uh, participated with us before. That's great. Um, another uh, good share have looked at the materials on the flightsafety.org website. And we welcome anybody who's joining this uh, for the first time. All right. So first of all, as we get started on what's in the level uh, three toolkits, we need to review a few terms that we've talked about in our last webinar. To really make sense of the safety data or information, we should we need to recognize broad categories of safety data. So we mentioned these categories the last couple of times. First of all, public safety information. And as safe as things are today, there are still accidents investigation reports. There's also summaries of those reports that are publicly available. Reputable organizations spend a fair amount of their time and resources to pour through and summarize the accident trends and describe the accident categories that affect the industry most. Safety program information is the second big broad term. Service providers in the industry gather their own information in many different ways to know how their processes are performing. They include the safety assurance monitoring that is going on through the auditing and monitoring and court recording of flight data analysis programs. And they also include safety reporting systems that are often voluntary and critical to hear what is happening from people most involved in day-to-day -day operations. And then lastly, there's the category of reportable occurrences. Regulators have usually defined certain types of events that they must be informed about through special reporting. This can be produced and shared through completions of forms or investigative reports that are completed between a service provider and its regulator. On data collection, we've also mentioned uh, in our previous recommendations in taking inventory of the collections that are already being done uh, and examining these across the top level risks for the industry. We suggested that generally there is an accountable organization and supporting organizations. Knowing what data is currently being collected and processed is a worthwhile effort. We talked about some of the common processes that are used to collect good information in all of these categories. But more importantly, if you don't have data in some of these categories, you may want to consider strengthening your processes by adding it, especially if that's uh, a risk area of high priority for your uh, organization. And then lastly, we mentioned the different types of data across all processes. Remember, each of these types of data has its own limitations. Information may be collected from many sources and may also involve information that is related to specific stakeholders. For example, airlines and other aircraft operators conduct audits of not only the activities of their organization, but the activities of other organizations providing contract services to them. Similarly, air navigation service providers and airports collect their own information through audits or other reporting mechanisms. Third party organizations also collect a significant variety of information when conducting audits for other organizations. For example, organizations that use contracted aviation to support their activities may wish to assess the risk resilience and safety system integrity of aircraft operators before utilizing them to provide services for their employees. In level three, we talk about carrying out studies that are more focused or directed in nature. As organizations mature, they introduce methods and tools suited towards these directed studies or focused observations. 
and the Line Operations Safety Audit, best known as LOSA, is just one such methodology now broadly used across the industry. The original LOSA model was designed for observing flood operations activities, but has now expanded to encapsulate maintenance and ramp activities as well. Further, ANSPs have developed this for normal uh, observations of air traffic control, known as normal operations uh, safety audit uh, systems. LOSA is a program that may, many will be familiar with. It was first developed by the University of Texas as a way of collecting information by an observer in a non-punitive and de-identified manner. Now, this approach seeks to identify deficiencies or non-conformances through the observation of activities during normal flight operations. An analysis of the results will assist in determining if certain observed deficiencies of non-conformance are an aberration, such as singular events, or a truly representative of a systemic issue where the same non-conformance is seen to consistently occur over a number of flights. Now this slide outlines a typical flow of the collection, analysis and sharing of information derived from LOSA. The first stage involves the collection of information through passive observation of activities undertaken on the flight deck. Activities include data entry, checklist usage, adherence, instrument settings and other activities associated with general flight deck management. The observer performs a passive role, generally not engaging with the crew during the conduct of the flight. Exceptions to this will include anything observed that could directly lead to an accident. For flight operations, LOSA observers are especially trained current or former pilots with a considerable amount of experience within complementary type operations. Similarly, for maintenance or ramp LOSA activities, observations may be made by former or active personnel on those roles. And the same goes for um, the NOS process used in air traffic control. LOSA audits may be conducted on a periodical or continuous basis and continual type LOSA programs are generally conducted in-house. The key value with LOSA audits is that they capture information in a passive manner during normal operations. Now, this allows the organisation to assess its performance against established procedures to identify non-compliance and, importantly, identify any threats or mitigation strategies that may not have previously been discovered. We mentioned earlier in our podcast that we plan to deal more with predictive processes in this portion of our toolkits. As we discussed during the data collection section, this can lead to many, uh, using many sources of data from all of the data types we mentioned previously. This may include audit data, voluntary data, public historical accident data. It may even include survey data. Now this data could be described as routine and non-routine because some of it is gathered regularly like an audit conducted on a regular schedule or non-routine because it was gathered for a specific study. But we know for sure it gets more involved at this level and the analysis is working to better understand specific problems where better performance is desired. The data can be used to conduct any number of different types of studies some might call targeted deep dives. They could be used to quantify the portions of an advanced bow tie analysis. It could be a response to a particular set of events where you may know some of the rates, but not why the occurrences are happening. Mark, can you give us an example of that? Sure. One possible example is where an airline might want to know more about a particular subject and upon implementing an operational change, an airline in collaboration with its regulator might be asking itself, what impact, if any, has that change had on fatigue risk and its exposure across the organization? The analysis starts with some specific desired outcomes. One is to construct an analysis report showing the sources of the data and the calculations on events in the study period. And secondly, what conclusions can be drawn from the data in order to provide information that will assist in specific actions in the risk management process. So as the study is constructed, 
the airline organization has to ask itself what data sources are going to be needed. The airline may have a multitude of sources and not all may apply, but some of them could be traditional data sources while others are operations data sources, not necessarily managed by a safety department. In this example, these are some potential airline answers to the questions that could help them complete the study. Question one, we probably need data before and after the change or to know the specific dates under which the change took place, including some of the implementation nuances. Was it done after a specific date? Was the implementation done in certain phases? What details fully describe the implementation? And then what tools or data tell us how we can make assessments of fatigue? Question two, what data sources are available for our study? And this could also take place in steps. What do we have now and what, what might need to be gathered later? As shown here, it could involve both internal and external data to the organization as long as the data quality can be assured. Question three, what specific sources provide what the organization needs to know? This can be a narrowing down of specific data that provides the most valuable indication of fatigue assessments, such as crew scheduling data, where fatigue calls have been made and documented, or where safety reports were submitted before and after the change, or where the specific operational schedules are documented before and after the change. Now, we didn't talk at all about use of things like actigraph watches, but that could be an additional uh, method of performing some very uh, Im uh, important data collection. So overall, this special study in this example and its process might look like this. One that starts with data identification, pr data prioritization and collection, and then followed by an organization of that data which is then followed by operational schedule analysis and then may include a loop where more data is necessary to add results, uh, add to the results of the analysis. Finally, a deep dive or targeted analysis is completed with conclusions, conclusions and recommendations. This may feed the work of teams that are constructed to take actions if necessary and the work will inform the rest of the organization on the findings. In some cases, it may lead to new mitigations or refinements in data that's being monitored. It may lead to better understanding on the risks and what emphasis might need to be applied to existing processes or risk barriers. Or it may lead to other future studies where risk trade-offs are being considered. But ultimately, the study should help the organization reveal weaknesses in their processes and put them in perspective from quantifying the risk. The study should make conclusions based on its standardized risk assessment matrix and the recommendations should be targeted at items that are unacceptable according to that risk. So that was one example. Now we want to move on to uh, safety performance indicators. In part two of our webinar, webinar series, we mentioned the use of safety performance indicator and enters, excuse me, safety performance indicators. And in our research, uh, we have found out what organizations are most uh, focused on uh, around the world. It's interesting that um, they have followed the key ICAO top three accident categories of CFIT, loss of control, and runway safety. But an airline organization may choose to adopt its own safety performance indicators and use one for each operational department. We mentioned the displays could look something like this as a dashboard depicts what indicators are showing the performance, where it's at, whether it's better or worse than target, and how well this might compare to any benchmarks they're using. So in this example, the flight safety safety performance indicator might be a combination of other metrics that include CFIT loss of control, approach and landing accident category risks, 
while the maintenance safety could be capturing system, component, or engine failure hazards that might lead to an aircraft technical malfunction that could become an accident. We've continued to study the safety performance indicators and metrics monitored across the aviation industry and have asked our members and the participants of our GSIP project to take this survey. We promised last time in our webinar to show some results, so we're really glad to hand this uh, part of the webinar over to Tim Wilkie, who's with uh, Fort Hill Group, and he has been helping us uh, with a study we've been doing on safety performance indicators. Welcome, Tim. Thanks, Mark, and good morning, everyone. So as Mark mentioned, as a part of the GSIP project, uh, Flight Safety Foundation has developed a safety performance indicator survey. To date, the survey has been an overwhelming success due to the high levels of support and participation by GSIP stakeholders around the globe. Uh, for those of you who are hearing about the survey for the first time, I'll quickly introduce it and then go over its intended scope and how you can gain access to it. For those attendees that may have already supported and participated in the survey, I'll be sharing some of the foundation's initial results. So uh, as Mark uh, discussed, SPIs allow an organization to define a set of desired safety goals and to establish a mechanism that allows them to evaluate the effectiveness of their daily actions towards achieving those goals. This survey aims to collect information from a variety of global aviation stakeholders about how they use SPIs and safety metrics within their own organizations. Uh, the foundation will use the results of the survey to help structure the GSIP toolkit and to conduct future GSIP workshops in a way that's most beneficial to the project stakeholders. The foundation will also use survey data to provide detailed recommendations for the use development and uh, refinement of SPIs and safety metrics that are based on industry-wide best practices. So the SPI surveys are completed online through the link that's on this slide. The survey itself asks respondents about their organization's use of SPIs, performance metrics, and data sources across several risk areas, such as uh, runway safety, CFIT, and others. On this slide, you can see a sample of the runway safety portion of the survey. So um, after a respondent completes the survey, the responses are then de-identified and integrated into an interactive dashboard, which uh, we'll use today to show our initial results. So some of the results. Uh, so far, the foundation has received over 60 responses from nearly all of the global ICAO region. Uh, while 80% of the responses were received from airlines or aircraft operators, uh, the foundation has recently started to see an uptick in responses from ANSPs, manufacturers, regulators, and other organizational stakeholders, which is very encouraging. This slide uh, presents an overview of the interactive dashboard I mentioned before that the foundation is using. Uh, the dashboard allows respondents to see the direct impact of their inputs to the or, you know, survey responses, as well as the total impact of inputs submitted by other respondents around the globe. When using this dashboard, uh, users will be able to develop on-demand safety intelligence just through the click of a mouse. So for example, you'll be able to customize how you view and interact with live response data through a set of filters. Uh, the filters include responses by risk area, domain, regional location, among others. So, for example, if you're an airline or aircraft operator, you might be interested in controlled flight into terrain or the CFIT risk area. So, by selecting CFIT, the dashboard automatically filters and displays all of the responses that relate to CFIT SPIs and safety metrics. To drill down even further, you can elect to see only those responses that were provided by airline and aircraft operators. Now that our data is 
filtered, you can see what respondents track as a CFIT SPI metric and the perceived importance of each item. So drilling down even further with the selected filters, on this slide we've zoomed in on the bottom part of the dashboard so you can get a better look at the response data. So for CFIT, the top responses for what's being tracked as part of an SPI includes enhanced ground proximity warning system alerts, pilot reports, and unstable approaches. In terms of metrics, we can see that about 80% of respondents track unstable approaches as a CFIT metric, followed by pilot reports and enhanced ground proximity uh, warning system alerts. And finally, we can see what the respondents think are the most important SPIs. Here they're rating short landing data and minimum safe altitude warnings as the top two most important. And finally, the dashboard allows us to see which data sources the respondents are using to track CFIT risk. The dashboard presents this information in descending order from left to right. So the most frequently cited source is flight data monitoring data, followed by voluntary safety reports, and then uh, occurrence reports. So hopefully this glance at the survey data has given you an idea of the valuable information that uh, is being collected in the survey. In the next webinar, Flight Safety Foundation will present the most up-to-date survey results and the impact of the information that's been collected in a little greater detail. I'd like to encourage all GSIP stakeholders, uh, especially today's webinar attendees, to take the survey. It takes about 15 to 20 minutes to complete, and uh, your responses will help the foundation shape the GSIP toolkits and workshops and provide insight into a topic area that currently has limited available information. Um, all your responses are secure, and they're all anonymous. Um, and additionally, we'd also like to ask you to please encourage your colleagues and other industry partners who are not on today's webinar to also participate in the survey. To access the survey, you can uh, navigate to the URL displayed on this slide. And this link's also available both on the Flight Safety Foundation website as well as in the webinar handout document that's um, available to you um, in the webinar. And uh, with that, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to Mark, Frank, and Greg. Thanks a lot, Tim. I'd like to point out of everything that we're displaying today, this is the part where we actually have some real data collected from people who have helped us out in uh, some of the research we're doing. And the results that you saw that Tim did a um, review of are also posted on our, uh, there's a link that brings you directly to those results on our website. Um, I think you have to look in industry updates. Is that right, Frank? Uh, actually, Mark, if you go, just navigate to the home page of the Flight Safety Foundation website at flightsafety.org, and in the upper right-hand corner of the home page, there's a box that is labeled industry updates, and the first item in that box is a small news item about the survey and the survey results. And the headline on it is, take the FSF safety performance indicator survey and see survey results. So if you simply click on that from the homepage, that'll take you to the blog or news item. And, and within the news item, there's a link to the survey. And at the very bottom of the news item, there's a link to the survey results. There's a, a button that says SPI survey results. Just click on it and it'll take you to the results. Cool. And I think that's updated once a week, so you can check back uh, at a later date if you uh, if you care to. Okay. Previously, we mentioned uh, bow tie analysis to illustrate the logical connections between events and undesired events or outcomes. Um, at level two, we introduced a simplified bow tie analysis, recognizing that any operation has its threats, its defenses normal recovery measures, and potential negative outcomes. Now, this is handy for breaking things down and quantifying in a risk assessment the exposure you have to the threats and the effectiveness of defenses and how that produces rates of an undesired state. 
If there are any weaknesses in recovery measures, they can be improved to avoid the negative outcomes. Now in this webinar, we want to show how bow tie analysis can be used for something much more complex. Whereas bow ties are a good illustrative tool for understanding how threats connect with the prevention barriers in an undesired aircraft state, when you've collected enough data, you can begin to assign a quantification on each element of the bow tie and then be able to understand how frequently each of these elements should be occurring. The special example shown here is the threats and barriers leading to a near mid-air collision. And the components of this example try to display some of the more prominent elements to illustrate a point about the use of these tools. This is showing the left-hand side of the bow tie analysis, and the numbers in the white boxes represent a fictitious rate or barrier effectiveness. If we switch to the right-hand side of the bow tie, the same sort of quantification can be applied here. Since the whole chart is tied together, and assuming you've broken out all the elements of the analysis, every box can be numerically calculated. And this can become a model under which you test your own experiences. If your actual experience is showing something different than what the relationship shows, it means that some portion of the risk picture is not performing how you expect it. Let's say your volume of TCAS resolution advisory warnings is higher than you expected. Through the model, you may find out your quantity of threats is higher, or if the quantity of threats is as expected, maybe you find out your expected effectiveness in your response is lower than expected. Likewise, this quantification of analysis may lead you to discovering where the leakest, weakest links could be strengthened and knowing exactly how well they need to work to achieve your safety performance targets. Of course, the level of quantification can go much further than what we've illustrated here. And as we said before, in every kind of analysis, no matter what the intensity, your analysis needs to incorporate how you identify and reveal the actual risks in the operation and the standardized risk matrix that we've discussed should be applied to any new hazards that are identified and what that means on whether or not they're acceptable or unacceptable. Okay, let's move on to how this information is shared. In level three of our toolkits, this can involve a lot more than one individual organization. It could involve a number of stakeholders. Greg, can you explain some of these sharing activities and relationships? Sure, Frank. Sharing safety information amongst industry stakeholders can and does take many forms. The means of achieving this can simply involve the exchange of narrative data through to industry meetings and perhaps evolving to a more mature model where data is captured and exchanged from various stakeholders and between states. In this first example, two or more airlines may have some commonality in the types of aircraft they are using or in the routes that they are operating. They may enter into an arrangement where they decide to share safety information that may be perceived as mutually beneficial. Not, air, not all airlines will enter into such arrangements for commercial sensitivity reasons. However, this may be attained at a high level where events of a commercial nature are not involved with the information shared originating from normal operations. In the second example, an airline may share safety operational information with a given air navigation service provider where these relate to aircraft. A good example of this is where air traffic control, in an attempt to expeditiously manage the flow of air traffic, may inadvertently set crews up for unstable approaches through the imposition of speed and distance requirements, or through rushed, rushed approaches where a late request is made for, for example, an aircraft to accept a landing on a parallel runway. In the third example, at a given location, there may be a local consultative process established where regular meetings are held between airlines, the airport, and the ANSP. Meetings between these stakeholders would seek to understand the operational issues faced by airlines 
and aircraft operators, together with air traffic management issues and challenges faced by controllers. The airport will be able to discuss and share its initiatives relating to facilities and environmental factors. Many airline, uh, many airline alliances such as One World, Star Alliance and other industry representative bodies have forums where information of a non-commercially sensitive nature is shared in a confidential setting. The information attained from these meetings is invaluable with many airlines operating complementary equipment. Similarly, these airlines may also share a number of common destinations. The information collected and compiled in this manner is far greater than that which a single airline would be able to capture in a similar time frame. This additional data may assist in identifying additional threats and associated risks that may not be readily apparent where a single airline is processing and analysing their own data alone. To take this further, airline alliances or industry associations may act as a convenient body to represent the safety interests of the airlines as a group to other stakeholders such as regulators, airports and others as shown here. Instead of each airline raising issues of concern on their own, a group approach from a representative body forms a more compelling means of presenting tangible data on threats and risks to other industry stakeholders. This is a very effective means of capturing and addressing issues of concern from a collective whole of industry approach. I'd like to point out that you'll find as you review some forms of the bow tie analysis that completing the analysis can't be done without some collaboration and sharing results between stakeholders. When we discuss bow tie analysis, the example we used was hazards leading to a mid, near mid-air collision. Notice that some of the hazards are being generated by flight crews and some are being generated by the air traffic controllers. Knowing this and properly applying the quantification may mean conducting collaborative work between stakeholders. Through this kind of analysis, the joint efforts of stakeholders can look at how each element is prioritized in risk and what might be the most likely chain of events uh, leading to a future accident. Well, how can the industry protect this information so that it doesn't become part of a newspaper story that suggests the discovery of safety issues is a failure of someone or some organization? Or worse, that the information becomes part of litigation that suggests the discovery is a criminal act and worthy of prosecution? So once again, we want to remind folks that are with us today on some of the things we've mentioned in the first and second webinars. Boundaries of acceptable and unacceptable behavior should be defined uh, for individuals. Voluntary safety programs should have protections for individuals from the company and the techniques should be utilized to keep identifying information from being disclosed throughout the risk management process. We also went on to say that state and regulatory support is essential within both policy and regulation but recognize there are very few countries that have established this yet for the kind of safety information we're mentioning here. This was followed in our second level of the toolkit to additional mechanisms that promoted protection, collaborations, such as advance arrangements, memorandums of understanding, or memorandums of agreement. Additionally, states and organizations implemented ICAO's recommended practices such as the protection of mandatory reporting systems and limiting disclosures during investigations. So safety information protection in the level three of our toolkits um, is the next step uh, where this, the SIP level three or our GSIP level three toolkit safety information protection is next step where the protection is formalized at the highest level between countries and organizations around the world through MOUs and similar agreements and training and education programs. The primary level three focus 
is achieving full collaboration between countries and organizations and the implementation of regional and global agreements and programs to protect safety information. The objectives are to improve the just culture environment and provide training or education programs within organizations and civil aviation authorities. The key attention of the Level 3 toolkit will be to offer guidance to develop innovative ways to protect safety information beyond existing efforts and arrangements to achieve the highest level of protection. Level 3 will also emphasize the need to offer training and education programs on safety information protection and just culture at all levels to equip aviation stakeholders with a solid understanding of safety information protection laws, regulations, policies, and advanced arrangements. We have a legal advisory committee helping us to develop model memorandums of understandings and other agreements and safety information policies based on existing arrangements from countries around the world. As we've mentioned today, the level three part of our toolkit focuses on the just culture that it's applied to the legal process and how that helps companies and states reach a full commitment to safety information protection. In the end, the level three toolkit will provide states and organizations guidance and tools to stakeholders on the protection of safety data and safety information through collaboration, policies, and precedent. But for all of it to really take hold within the organization, it will need the appropriate education programs within many organizations and civil uh, authorities. So we've gotten to um, near to the end in today's webinar. And uh, we just want to remind you that we've talked about proactive and predictive nature of the data collection and analysis um, within level three of our toolkits. Without information protection, the other activities are not really stable activities. The work to do these studies may fall apart the first time someone comes looking for uh, a person or organization to blame. So if those are the four activities that uh, we've been working on and we believe uh, need help and improvements, we'd like to hear from you. Of those four uh, activities, which uh, it deems the highest priority for you? Uh, where do you think uh, the, that most improvements are needed within the industry? So as we post this, if you'd um, reply to this uh, survey or poll, and uh, we'll monitor how many folks have responded. Looks like we got about 70%. That looks good. I think we can share that back with everybody. Pretty strong on the data analysis and information sharing uh, today. Interesting. Um, it's a little bit different from the webinar we uh, conducted earlier today, and we had a pretty uh, even uh, uh, arrangement between many of the categories. Um, so when it comes to uh, our question and comment area, uh, maybe there's some folks that might be able to ask us some questions in these areas that gives us a little bit uh, more of an idea of why there's strong interest in those areas. Okay. Um, we do have a few things to uh, share with you for a conclusion. Um, in each section of our toolkits, we focused on the critical items needed for success. And we lay those out uh, in a checklist uh, in our toolkits. We've got a quick summary of that for level three and what we've covered today in our webinar. Uh, we want good data. This level of intensity, it's aimed exclusively at proactive and predictive efforts which we believe means understanding the data at the contributory factors level. Programs like LOSA and NOS are good tools to examine operations much deeper and collect data that explains what's really happening. We want good analysis. We mentioned some trend analysis, but we also mentioned more about the dynamics of safety performance indicators and advanced bow tie analysis tools. With the conclusion of all this analysis to be applied just as it's been applied 
in the past to a standardized risk assessment matrix. Sharing results, we introduced sharing of information in the risk management process with other industry stakeholders and partnerships. The effort to collaborate isn't just related to sharing the results, it can sometimes be combined with an effort to work with others on further analysis of the results. And protecting information, we want to uh, develop ways uh, to really improve uh, the collaboration and uh, advance just culture environment at the regional and global uh, levels. So just a reminder in terms of uh, what the different levels are, we spent time in the last three webinars covering detailed content in each of these. Um, and up until this point, uh, we've really focused on what each organization can do to get to a higher level of effectiveness out of their own process and to begin to work with uh, stakeholders. So that brought us through parts one, uh, level one, two, and three. And part four, or our next webinar series, what next webinar event will touch on what we think might be recommended in level four. At this point we haven't written the details of level four as we think it may best uh, be constructed if it contains the things that are suggested by both industry and government that go beyond what might be widely practiced today. So tune in with us as we discuss together what might be possible in level four next month. Okay, so access to the draft detailed toolkits that we've discussed during our webinar series can be found on the Flight Safety Foundation website in the GSIP section. Now you must have a Flight Safety Foundation membership in order to see these. If you have registered for our past webinars or workshops, we have assigned a temporary membership access to our site through a separate email. And we would like you to examine what we've developed so far and provide us with your feedback. We would like you to be able to see what other organisations have considered for safety performance indicators and uh, help us study what is being used today. You are encouraged to take the survey. The survey may take 20 minutes or so, but we think you will find better insight into the SBIs just by taking the survey. And you can go there, uh, you can find the link to this in the handout that will be provided. See the dates for the last part of our webinar series. For those that have registered for this webinar and all other members, you will get email reminders from GoToWebinar. If you want to make sure it's on your calendar, please see the link in the handout for registration. Now lastly, if you want to give us some constructive feedback on our toolkits and this process, please see the Membership Centre link on the handout.